Welcome to the Customer Wins Podcast, where business leaders discuss their secrets and techniques for helping their customers succeed and in turn, grow their business. Hi, I'm Rich Walker, the host of The Customer Wins, where I talk to business leaders about how they help their customers win and how their focus on customer experience leads to growth. Some of my past guests have included Joe Moss of Pro Advisor Suite, Stephanie Danabom of Danabom Consulting, and Sid Yenamandra of Surge Ventures. Today, I'm speaking with Lacey Shrum, founder and CEO of SmartKX. And today's episode is brought to you by Quick, the leader in enterprise forms processing. When your business relies upon processing forms, don't waste your team's valuable time manually reviewing the forms. Instead, get quick. Using our Form Extract API, simply submit your completed forms and get back clean, context-rich data that reduces manual reviews to only one out of a thousand submissions. Visit quickforms.com to get started. All right, I've been looking forward to this for quite some time. Lacey Shrum is the founder and CEO of SmartKX, dedicated to revolutionizing AUM fee billing for financial advisors through cutting edge technology. With a deep understanding of the regulatory challenges in the financial sector, Lacey created SmartKX to provide seamless, automated, and compliant revenue solutions that simplify fee filling, fee filling, fee billing, and enhance transparency. Lacey, welcome to The Customer Wins. Hi, thanks so much for having me. Well, even though I'm saying things backwards, this is great. I'm excited to talk to you. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I'm so excited too. (laughs) Anybody who hasn't heard this podcast before, I love to talk to business leaders about what they're doing to help their customers win, how they built and deliver a great customer experience, and the challenges to growing their own company. Lacey, let's understand your business a little better. How does your company help people? Yeah, thanks. Um, So we help um, registered investment advisors ensure that they are um, maintaining their fiduciary duty and they are documenting and calculating their own fees correctly, um, basically to make sure, help them make sure that they are not inadvertently stealing money from clients or inadvertently leaving their earned cash on the table. Okay, so when I was an advisor, I worked under a broker dealer through their RIA. I I don't recall this problem at all. How complex is this? How how big of a problem is this for advisors? Yeah, so um, most advisors, the SEC has said most advisors have this problem. Um, very from a regulatory standpoint, very simply, the contract and the ADV does not match what they are charging hmm. and collecting from their client. It's a very manual process. Um, And in combination with fees sort of being this add-on service by other, you know, portfolio management companies, um, services out there, it's kind of, it has always been a report you could run, but um, the automation pieces haven't really been there. And so a lot of firms are adding their own automation, doing a lot of Excel on top of it, um, some really heavy manual labor. If you ask any firm, the person in charge of billing, like how is the first of the quarter for you? They'll usually say, oh, I hate it. (laughs) (laughs) And it's the time when they're making money. That should be the best part. So (laughs) yeah. Well, so a couple of things come to mind, but one of them, and I don't mean this to be flippant whatsoever, but isn't everybody just using QuickBooks these days? Um, QuickBooks doesn't calculate an AUM fee. So it's because I, mean, I think about like billing. So this is about collecting the data necessary to calculate the fees and do it correctly. Does Correct. that mean that your system is helping them track the contract and the contract terms as well? Yes. Okay. So that that's greatly simplifying things because like you said, they're doing everything Excel. And isn't that every advisor's favorite tool? <laughs> <laughs> It is. Um, it is every advisor's favorite tool. Um, I think, you know, if they were on an uh, island by themselves and could choose three things, they'd probably choose Excel. Um, but yeah, it's, I mean, you hit the nail on the head with the client agreement. Uh, these agreements have provisions that say how an advisor is getting paid, not only getting paid, but really paying themselves. The advisors have this really cool thing where they can calculate their own fee and pay themselves. Um, and those words live in the document. And then they also have another place, 
uh, where they're calculating. And those words in that place, they don't talk to each other. We make them talk to each other. Got it. So does that mean you have oversight as well to give them compliance reviews or help them when they go through compliance reviews? We do. So we definitely help. Um, we have the books and records to give them on their fee calculations, um, what they've been charging in the past, of course, if they get examined. Um, but compliance people love us because we have some features where we, um, compliance people, part of their reviews are looking at the contract versus the fee. Uh, just talked to an advisor today. He has 500 clients. They do, they bill quarterly. So every quarter they review a quarter of their clients. So 125 clients, they look at their contract. They look at the fee. Does it match? Hmm. So you can imagine this is like a ton of time. Yeah. Right. And just like very boring. Nobody wants to do it. Uh, and so we have some really great features. Like you can just send that fee schedule directly to the client and eliminate the need for that audit. Um, so yeah, compliance um, teams, com outside compliance consultants love that because they, it can automate a and, you know, almost re eliminate this very required and important piece of compliance, but also very boring. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. I mean, I think about it, the, the advisor is there to help the client. And so that's where they want to spend most of their time. Yeah. And running a business is just like, ah, uh, I have to run this business too. It's taking <laughs> time away from me. <laughs> yeah. And like, they don't want to spend their time making sure that they didn't overcharge the client. Like, obviously yeah. that's very important, but like they want to go spend the time with their clients or getting more clients or with their families. Um, I think I'm the only one I found out there who's as obsessed with AUM fees that does, you know, this, this is my role. This is what I love checking, but other people would rather be doing other things, even with their professional time. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm curious about something else. If, if, if your clients are using this to review their fees quarterly, does that help them review their clients in terms of keeping clients, you know, engaging with clients, choosing who's their ABC clients, that kind of stuff? Yeah. So when we started calculating fees, um, not only, so we do the fee calculate, like our core competency is really that fee calculation. Um, and the compliance aspect is an add on, like that is something that's needed and that we've added on. And the other thing that we found is really that advisors were lacking insight into their revenue. So being able to say, you know, what is my AUM? How has that gone up? My billable, what is my billable? Um, my quarterly or monthly revenue, how has that gone up or down over time? That's kind of high level stuff, but then you get into like the really good metrics of, okay, um, what, how many assets do I have as no bill? How many assets am I not, aren't in a billing schedule and are just sort of sitting out there? Um, overall why blended. Why, what do you mean? Why, why do they have assets that are not billable? <laughs> Oh, Rich. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't been an advisor for 20 years, so I'm missing stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, it could be anything. Um, a lot of times it's psychological. Um, either it's two things. <clears throat> it's new assets that, assets that have come in. It's accounts that they're like, well, we're not going to bill on because they're just putting cash there. Um, you know, that's how it'll start. And then maybe they'll, you know, start investing in it and it just doesn't get added to a fee schedule. Um, and then some of it's really like, well, you know, we have, we have these assets sitting over here. We're not really doing anything. We don't want to bother them. Like we'll just no bill on it. You know, it's just mm -hmm. easier to sort of leave it there or it's a negotiation technique with a client. Like, well, we won't bill on your Tesla, you know, your concentrated holding or whatever it is. And so it starts out like that. And then they, they're just levers that advisors can pull if they get pushed back on the fees or get pushed back on other things. Advisors will negotiate their fees and sometimes take some of them to no bill. I know I interrupted uh, what you were saying about all this, but does that mean that you're helping advisors have clarity on this as well? Yes. Um, it, it, that is probably the biggest surprise. So. ADV is one of the surprise, biggest surprises. The second surprise is you will ask an advisor, okay, what do you expect your blended rate is? Like your AUM is X, 
what do you think your overall blended rate is? Because most of them are on tiers, always, you know, clients are on different fee schedules. And they'll say something like, oh, it's probably 95 to 100 bips. And you run this calculation, you're like, well, it's actually 70. And they're like, no way. <laughs> you're like, wow. yes. So your overall blended rate is 70. And why is that? And that's when you start getting into the things like no bill assets, orphaned accounts, um, fee structures that were negotiated, you know, with inflation even four or five years ago um, that are just so different and irrelevant now. And time creeps up and all of a sudden, instead of 95 bips, you're looking at 70 bips. Um, And that's a huge surprise to most advisors. You know what I love about this, Lacey? is when you run a business, it's interesting to have different metrics to measure your business by. And not just top line revenue or bottom line profit, but these types of metrics, like you're saying, what's your blended rate? For me, and, and look, we don't bill this way, but I, I always looked and said, how many forms do we generate? How much money do we make? Therefore, mm-hmm. what's each form generating for us? And mm-hmm. I do it in terms of how many forms are in the library and how many forms we build. And, and you discover different aspects of your business. In fact, I'll share one other thing. We we run our financial numbers. And one thing we've noticed is our dollar of revenue per dollar of labor and what that ratio is. And we have seen that when that goes up by 20 or 30 cents, we can hire somebody. When it drops down below a certain, mm. certain level, we need to cut back on our spending. And it's this very unique metric. And I feel like... Nuanced. Yeah. And, and nobody would tell you that in business school. Nobody would tell you that because no. it's your unique business. And I feel like you've just uncovered something... Maybe everybody knows it, but that seems like a, one of those magical numbers to pay attention to. Yeah, we've really found that it's surprising. It seems so basic, but you know, you talk about your business, um, my business. It's it's been interesting to sort of look at the advisory business, which I've known so well, and then once you get into a SaaS business, and just the similarities, I think, has helped a lot there. Um, and some really cool, like other metrics that we're launching, you know, in the SaaS business, you look at things like, um, your recurring annual recurring revenue, lifetime value of a user, um, what that, you know, expected duration for them is. And so we're translating that for the advisory business as in, you know, who, what are, how much time are you spending with advisors? That's some cool stuff we're working on with the CRM. Like who's taking up the most time? What are your top performing agreements? Um, because a lot of times those get out of whack. We all hear about the clients that have $100,000 that take up four hours of your time and the clients that have $10 million and take up you know yeah. one. Um, and so getting those things really in line. And then we actually had a suggestion and they're like, you should look at the, because the baby boomer age is shifting so much, Um, And that is going to start phasing out. We're going to see this massive wealth transfer, like looking at life, you know, expected (laughs) lifetime value of these clients um, and what that looks like. And if you're financially prepared for that revenue to shift Um, and then you can also get into a lot of also, sorry, I I suppose you're also giving people this insight of who's make who you're making money with, but spending zero time with. Because yeah. those are the ones you're going to lose in this transition of wealth as well. Yeah, exactly. Um, and the other thing that has been a real eye opener, I think, going to the advisory side is just your recurring revenue. Like what, when you're selling your business, transitioning it, get even getting a valuation for leverage, um, the assets are your client agreements and that really sweet recurring revenue. And so helping advisors you know, give a health check to those things before they enter into an M&A or a, um, any sort of valuation is really cool. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Okay. I have a couple of things about that, but, um, are you tracking metrics for this industry and seeing key metrics that help predict health, predict saleability valuations? Cause in the SaaS world, there's a lot of that, mm-hmm. right? So are you seeing specific metrics in the advisory world that you're uncovering through all this? Um, some that's, that's a little further than where we've gotten with advisors. Um, some of the metrics that are preliminary metrics of what we're looking at is, 
um, of course, like the overall blended rate, but then it's really like a health rate of your client agreements and the fees. If you have client agreements that say you should be charging 100 bips and you're only charging 90 bips because your system's wrong, no one updated it, you told the client you would do this for so long and you're like, oh, it's just, you know, we'll just eat the cost or whatever. Like that's a mismatch for anyone. You know, that is, I wouldn't say that's a detrimental health rating, but that's like not a great health rating, right? Like there's a lot of um, revenue that can be made up there. So we're starting to see that and be able to return to advisors. Like, you know, here's sort of the health of your ARR. Um, so that's been really cool to see. So I, I got to kind of make fun of us for a second because we're talking jargon and not all of my listeners are financial advisors. Mm. So BIPs is basis mm. points, which is a measurement of percentage. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you said ARR, annual recurring revenue. So not to get too technical and lose everybody, but um, my, my other question for you is, is your product geared towards a, an RIA as an individual or a firm with hundreds of advisors? What, what scale is this really working best at? Yeah, it's really, so this problem exists across the industry. So from the day you hang up your own shingle, um, most advisors have no idea what AUM fee billing is or how to even explain it to their client or the regulator, which the regulator will ask mm -hmm. um, in your entrance exam. And so from that up to, you know, you kind of hit, um, a growth period and you're at about 250 million to maybe 750, 800 million. That's another point where we see a lot of advisors say, okay, I may have been using Excel. I may have been kind of scratching this together, but like now I've got advisors working for me. I have, you know, other things that I need to take care of. Like we've got to take it to the next level. Um, and so that's where we're able to help a lot to you know, just give them confidence and time back in their day. And then also really we've had advisors, multiple advisors say like, you make me look like bigger, faster, stronger. And like, that's a huge confidence builder for me with my clients and my prospects. Um, so that size is, that's really like our core size, but we're also seeing like firms that are acquiring. So if you have a big firm and you're, you know, at a certain custodian, you acquire other custodian, custodial assets. Um, adding that expertise in there and getting that revenue quickly producing for you um, mm -hmm. is really, that's what you're buying, right? So you want to collect the revenue fast. Yeah, man, this is such an important thing. I, it, you know, in software companies like ours, we've been in business for over 20 years. So we have a variety of different contracts and therefore pricing terms. And we mm -hmm. Thankfully, don't lose our enterprise customers. I still have customer number one, two, three, four, so, you know, 18, 20 years in. But that means our billing is so different across different customers. And to track all that, I think we need your product. <laughs> I don't <laughs> know if I can apply to SaaS, but it sounds like it. <laughs> yeah, it's funny you say that because I have some users that come to me and they've got like a pretty good book. Like, you know, they've got five, 600 relationships and they say the same thing. Um, or they say like, you know, quarterly in advance, the very basic, everyone, everyone uses it. Um, they say that, you know, it doesn't really work for me. I don't like being beholden to four market days a year, but I don't know how to switch it. And that's a really cool piece of having the contract and the fee calculator work and talk to each other is that we can send those notices or those documents out immediately. And as soon as they come back, you're good to go. Like you don't need to do anything else. It's it's already set up, ready to go on your new system. And it's been cool to see like help advisors through that internal transition um, and just sort of give them what peace of mind they are looking for there very quickly. That is awesome. You know, it just occurred to me really how powerful this is because, I, so I got to step back. I run my company like I could sell it tomorrow. I'm not for sale. I'm not interested in selling my company. I run it that way to be professional, mature, conservative, you know, operate well. I don't treat it like a piggy bank, like a lot of founders might. And it's really just a mindset, right? But one of the things I'm gathering from what you're saying is if another firm, if an advisory firm thinks they might sell their company in some point in time, when somebody wants to come in and evaluate, you can show them, I know all my contracts, I know all my fees. 
I am billing according to what I'm allowed to bill for, not more, not less. That is huge value. That kind of clarity in a sale process must give them so much of an edge in the M&A process. Are you hearing about that at all? Yeah. I mean, I think it's value, even if there's no, if, if your valuation isn't even increased because of those metrics, the simple fact that you aren't paying a first year associate to go in and <laughs> do right. diligence every single contract, is it in good order? Is the billing schedule, the traditional one, something different? Is that what we're actually doing? Is that the revenue? Um, just the hourly rate you'll save alone in that is probably astronomical. Have being have being a first year associate at one time. But yeah, it's the the monetary piece of it is easy to describe to a, an acquirer. Um, and it's also just the confidence of like, okay, like this this firm has it together. Like they know what yeah. they do are doing. They care about not only their own business, but we, we kind of lose sight of this, like of the job they were hired to do, which is to take care of their clients' money. And like the fact that they can take their, their payment out of their clients' accounts, if they're flippant about it, that gives me a little pause <laughs> as to like, what else are we flippant about? Um, yeah. It's a super important job to manage somebody's money, let alone pay yourself. Um, and so, yeah, it's such it an irony, be, right? Yeah. I, I'm going to be your financial advisor. I'm going to help you manage your money, but I can't manage my money well. Like that, yeah. that shouldn't be allowed. <laughs> <Or> like, <laughs> and like, I'm allowed to pay myself. And like, sometimes I don't do it. You know, I don't have yeah. these systems in place to check it, but, um, yeah. So no, that, that's, that, that's what makes it really fun for us is like being able to add that confidence and that clarity. Um, and of course drive valuations. That's the whole point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and you're you're giving a level of professionalism and maturity, standard operating procedure to that advisory firm. I think that is totally awesome, Lacey. So let me ask a different question. Where does AI play a role in all this? I mean, couldn't AI just do all this for us? <laughs> um, yeah, maybe I don't know. I would love to copy my brain. One of the cool things that we're working on on the AI front is <clears throat> this combination. So we talked a lot about the client agreement, you know, the agreement between the firm and the client, what I'm going to do for you, what you're going to pay me. Um, and one piece we haven't talked about is the ADV, which is the disclosure. It's a public disclosure that the advisor tells clients and really anybody who wants to read it, any conflicts of interest they have. One of those conflicts is obviously like how you're going to get paid. Hmm. Um, no advisor, except for the ones you see on LinkedIn. Um, our mother, Teresa, <laughs> we're getting some sort of compensation. <laughs> uh, and so that ADV, again, is very written and you have to disclose certain things about how you're charging fees. And so what we always do when we have a new user come on is we I review that and I make sure that the way that we're setting up their calculator is exactly as it's described in the ADV. And a lot of times there's things that need cleaned up in there, but you can see like getting those three pieces, the contract, the ADV and the calculator all synced up and, um, you know, with some AI sprinkled in there um, to be less of Lacey's brain and my team's brain and more automated um, will be really exciting. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Do you do you see, though? Um, I don't know. Do, do you see this helping advisors generate better contracts going forward with their their clients as well? Yeah, I, um, I see, I don't know if I, you know, lawyers will take a different approach. I think AI has some great capabilities with, um, drafting pieces and really, I mean, developers will tell you that AI has, you know, sort of replaced a junior developer. Like you can get a lot of stuff out of there that you would have a first year junior developer do. Um, so I think there's a lot of room for that for lawyers, but I don't think by any means, like I, I realistically, and I'm as, I'm as big as techie as anybody out there. Like I really realistically do not see lawyers being replaced or having like a completely drafted document um, out of 
AI, but I certainly see um, a lot of places where like compare and contrast could be really useful where we could start cutting hourly time out of um, that place for lawyers. Um, but I, we're not getting rid of lawyers anytime soon. And I don't ever see a place there's, we could talk about this for a long time. There's always LinkedIn chatter of like doctors, lawyers, and financial advisors. Um, <laughs> I don't think, I don't know if we're getting rid of the doctors and the lawyers anytime soon. <laughs> or, or the advisors. I mean, honestly, I, I don't think you can replace the human element with any kind of program. And, and you know, a lot of people I've talked to on this show have echoed a similar thing that AI doesn't replace anybody. AI enhances people. And so you're more likely to get replaced by somebody who knows AI better. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's more of a, a tool set at the moment. But I mean, there's some fantastic things happening. I, I, okay, this wasn't in your bio that I read and I've forgotten. Mm -hmm. Are you a lawyer? I am. Okay, I thought so. So yeah. what is what is KX in your Smart KX brand name? Yeah, so KX is shorthand for contract. Um, that you'll use you use a lot in law school, um, sometimes in practice, but if you're talking about a contract, you would use the word KX. Um, <laughs> and so that was the that was the smart, that was the start of smart KX is um I'll be interested if if I do this analogy, I'm not gonna tell you where it came from. Um, I'm gonna see if any of your listeners know. Uh, but the the idea that like, instead of having all these different ledgers or systems of what the fee should be, the written word, how it's going to be calculated, the execution, like all have those come from one place. And it could be, you know, a digital agreement. So you can have digital agreements, calculate the fee, you can have them kick off workflows, you can have them complete um, different deliverables and really have that contract be smart or digital. And back to your question about AI, like replacing the um, legal part, I do think you'll see contracts going more digital and being able to be in real time um, and very like clearly articulated and kept up to date. Um, so that's really the the background of Smart KX and where the name came from. Got it. Okay. So what's your advice to advisors who are super dependent on Excel? Get out. <laughs> Stop yeah. doing it. <laughs> I mean, with anything, I think I use Excel like we all do, but we're, we're talking about this a lot right now um, because we've helped so many advisors. Like we had an advisor that came to us that had like 42,000 cells in Excel running his fee calculation every quarter. Wow. And so not only is that a lot to maintain, but if you have one thing in the middle of those cells that you is incorrect or a mistake and every month or quarter you're copying and pasting that, it's just like continuing to live and get worse. And there's actually an advisor out there who is in federal prison right now um, cause he was running Excel and there was errors in the formulas and they were never caught. Wow. Um, so yeah. And I, I mean, yes, that could, that could happen, but it's also just like, you're all by yourself in there. Like you have no team to back you up. You have no clear eyes to like, it's, you've been looking at the same thing for years. Like you got to get some, someone in there that is an expert that can back you up and make sure that things are running as they're supposed to be. So for big things, if you're doing too many formulas, whether it's fees or anything, like you got to get out of there. <laughs> like there's too much technology and expertise out there for you to be suffering alone. So if you ever thought you should start delegating, this is where you start. Yeah. Get rid of Excel. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm going to have to tell my mom to listen to this episode because she used to develop uh, spreadsheet automations for people, including financial advisors. And I'm going to ask her, I'll just ask her now, did did you make any of those errors for those advisors? <laughs> <laughs> well, she, I mean, that, that's like how, that's, that's how all the software started, right? Like, that's awesome that that's part of, like, she's part of history. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, I'm gonna have to wrap this up pretty quickly here. So I do have another question, but before we get there, what is the best way for people to find and connect with you? Um, yeah, so I'm on LinkedIn. 
um, Lacey, L-A-C-E-Y, Shrum, S-H-R-U-M. Um, Smart KX is on there. And then we're at smartkx.io. Uh, lots of info about what we do there, how we help advisors. Uh, and then, of course, ways to get in contact with me or my team. Awesome. Awesome. All right. So this is actually one of my favorite questions to ask. So people have heard this before, but who has had the biggest impact on your leadership style and how you approach your role today? Yes. So uh, I would I would actually say my children. Um, being the leader of your home is a very, very similar, but very much more intense than leading, leading a team. So much harder. <laughs> it's so Just much the, harder. The patience and the care and the, um, and also, but I, patients care are two things, but also just like the longevity of your impact and as being a leader, right? Like you are setting the stage, you're setting the tone, you're setting a foundation for this person's entire life. So, you know, you're, you're hope that we got like 90, 95 years left on there. Um, and so then when you come and sit down at your desk and you're being a leader, like, I think those things are still running back there and are things that I try to keep top of mind of like, you are impacting this person's livelihood, obviously today, but like, you know, their, the rest of their career, like what kind of influence can you have on that? What kind of influence can you have and help and support them to get where they want to be, but also where you need to, them to be, um, and do so with love and patience. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, be, be sort of like the steady state for them and like someone to lean on. And that all those things are like very grounded in parenting. Man, you gave me a whole new perspective. Nobody's answered the question that way. And I love it because if you do approach leadership with care, with interest, with, you know, intent to help the person, because you can't fire your kids. I mean, I haven't found a way. So know. <laughs> you, you only can promote them or make them hate you, whichever way you want to go is your choice. But yeah, I think if you approach leadership that way, you are serving your clients really, really well. I, I love that. Yeah. And you have like your goal is you want you want your kids to be successful. And like your goal as a leader should be like you want your clients or your employees or those around you to be successful. Like end of story. That's like that's the goal. You know, there's an underpinning to the show that comes across in nuanced ways, and you're you're representing it so clearly here, which is you have to love your customer. If you love your customer, you serve them so well. You you create the best experience for them and the best success for them. And I think that's abundantly clear that you love your customer, and this is why you're doing Thanks. it. Thanks. Um, well, thank you. You echo um, one of the best, I think, Dallas, Dallas and Texas companies out there, which is Southwest. Nice. Um, just what you said, you know, like taking care of taking care of your people or like that's going to build you the best business. So. Yeah. All right. I want to give a big thank you to Lacey Shrum, founder and CEO of Smart KX for being on this episode of the Customer Wins. Go check out Lacey's website at smartkx.io. And don't forget to check out Quick at quickforms.com where we make processing forms easy. I hope you enjoyed this discussion. We'll click the like button, share this with someone and subscribe to our channel for future episodes of The Customer Wins. Lacey, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me. Thanks for listening to The Customer Wins Podcast. We'll see you again next time and be sure to click subscribe to get future episodes.